going to read read this first so that you know uh, what it is that I'm talking about. This is a, a posting from our forum, uh, recent times, uh, a report on the, from a, one of our people, the username is Roed, who, uh, who has been with us for some time now and has been uh, willing to help by reporting his experience in the, over time in the work that we were doing. John and Carla, I'm curious how you finally got out and what that was like without the knowledge about the tension we have now. I have fed friends and family going through recovery, but in many cases they don't know what's going on or even that something is happening to them and it's hard to communicate about it directly. People are very sensitive. To me, it certainly looks like they are recovering from the fear, but often they don't recognize or accept this themselves. It's quick and easy to do the looking, but to start training attention is difficult and requires sustained determination before the value of it becomes obvious. So I wonder, what finally drove you sane? Is life just so in your face, rich one day, that you can't help join the party? Or was it control over attention the key all along? Good question. There's a number of things here that I would like to say something about. I'm going to start by answer, answering your question. So for me, and I believe for Carla too, for me, it was just a matter of enduring it. We didn't know at that time anything that could be done about it. There were times when, for me, it felt like uh, it would never go away, that the rest of my life I would be uh, in this state where every stupid thing that I ever thought came to, to uh, cause me trouble and every idea that I never had came to say, well, you should do this, not that. Uh, everything I tried didn't work. It was just a, it was a horror show. And, but, there was, and I think that if you consider it yourself, whoever's listening, there was some space between me and the wildness and craziness and stupidity that was happening in my mind. There was some sense of space there that allowed me to, and I'm like, again, I'm looking back at what was happening then, but which allowed me to believe that this would, that this would go away eventually. There were also a couple of, uh, you know, there were, a number of times when some previous um, stupidity would come to light only to <laughs> be laughed at and uh, uh, given the hook, uh, so to speak. Uh, that was just, just the um, way in which the whole mess was you know, every once in a while, <laughs> every once in a while you, you catch something with, 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 every once in a while you get something good. You, you see something you didn't see before. And over time, those times when there was some sense, something really could not be explained in any way other than something really fundamental had happened to my mind. Those things happened too. The one that I, I often bring to bear, bring, bring to people's consciousness is uh, smoking. Now I, I, uh, I smoked non-filter camel cigarettes for all my life. 
<laughs> I, I almost would think that I came out of the womb with a non-filter camel cigarettes in my mouth. I didn't smoke as much as most people do. I rarely smoked a whole pack in a day, but I, there was never a day that I wasn't smoking camel non-filter cigarettes. And you know, I wouldn't, didn't even think about the possibility of quitting in the first place. We were in a time when we were told that everything was fine with smoking cigarettes. And in the second place, I was uh, hooked on them. It would be maybe the, the, the camel cigarettes became part of my uh, uh, integral part of my personality and the way in which I presented myself in the world and the way in which people saw me in the world. And then I'm going to say that it was maybe 2006, call it 2006. I was, uh, and my habit was, in this camel cigarette room, my habit was that before I went to bed, I would go out on the back porch and have a cigarette, and then I'd come in and wash up so I wouldn't stink like cigarettes and go to bed with the car. And one day I was out there with my usual camel cigarette, ready to light it and uh, smoke away, I started to light this cigarette and a thought, a thought form, an algorithmic thought form arose in my mind that said, uh, you ought to quit. And then another thought form arose in my mind that said, yeah, you probably ought to quit, but you know, it's probably too late. You, whatever damage you've done is already done, so why? You know, why uh, not enjoy this uh, this little thing that you enjoy? And then another <laughs> algorithmic thought form. It was the dueling algorithms going on here. Another algorithmic thought form came and said to me, "Well, uh, it might not do any good, but it certainly won't do any harm." And I just stopped smoking. I never smoked another cigarette, and it was easy. It wasn't, there was really kind of nothing to it once the, the, the decision was made. I just stopped smoking and have never gone back to them, not, not once, not ever. So what I'm trying to um, show here is that in the first place, once you've done the looking, once that context of fear has been destroyed, the, the, the pump that pumps all the, the misery out, once that's destroyed, um, you're going to be okay. Uh, and once that's destroyed, you probably will be able to recognize some space between the, the war that's going on in your mind and you some space. And you, over time, I would expect that those who, who are, you know, those who, who have, have just heard about this and done it and, uh, and succeeded in it and now are going through recovery, uh, for the most part, people are going to feel like things are worse than they ever have been. But you can ask them, you can see is there not some little space between you and all that misery? Some space where the misery isn't present. And if you see that that's the case, that will make it easier all by itself. And it'll be a confirmation to you that what you have done has, has actually had the effect that we expect it to have, and it will come out right in the end. It's also, if you're if you're speaking to the people, it also gives you an opportunity to bring in the matter of um, self-directed attention as a way to become 
skillful and intelligent in the relationship with what's happening to your mind. What's happening to your mind is a complete uh, reset, really. And, uh, and it'll, ha it'll go, no matter whether you do anything or don't do anything, it'll come out all right in the end. Came out all right in the end for me and Carla. And for me, and it came out all right in the end for me, is really saying something. So it's going to come out all right in the end. The thing is, from our point of view, so anyway, Roy, if you are listening to this, speak to them, like, like talk to them about what it's like. Uh, you know, anybody, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise you ever to force a conversation on anybody. But if, if there's anybody that is around you that has done the looking, and is and seems to be uh, suffering from the, uh, the you know the continuing difficulties. It's possible for you to suggest to them that again, is there not a space between you and that? Is there not some space from which you can decide to not attend to? And the more, and it, see, the thing is that all of the, the reactions, and believe me, we have a lot of experience with this, all of the reactions to what you suggest to them will be discarded by the mind. But the person will hear it anyway. And, and the person still is connected to that sickness, but not sick with it. So, I think that it's, first of all, if you do nothing, I'm confident that it will turn out right for them. And I'm also confident that in the end, if it takes as long as it took me, in the end, they probably will not have any idea what has happened. They will be sane and, and uh, uncomplicated human beings in the way that, that uh, human beings are meant to be, but they will have no idea how that came to pass. And uh, that's okay. I would rather people be free without knowing what made them free than not to be free at all. But we live in really terrible times right now. And, and I, myself, and Carla, we really think that the world needs to hear this. So that and the fact that the world needs to hear this, the world of human beings needs to hear this, means that the human beings who have tried this and succeeded should be out there talking to people, trying to help, or, you know, working with us in a way to, to, uh, to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish here, which we don't have the means or the, the uh, skill, really. Uh, we, our skills are skills that we are learning as we go along. So, that's what I think. And again, if you do nothing, if nobody ever says a word to those folks that gives them some path out of their confusion and misery, they will be okay in the end. They will most likely not be able to tell what exactly happened or how it unfolded. They'll probably be surprised when they notice it. But they'll be okay in the end. Getting free from the fear of life can cause no trouble. None whatsoever. It's not going to make things worse. In the interim, while the diseased mind is reformulating itself, in that interim period, there will be a lot of misery and a lot of, of confusion and a lot of uh, 
there won't be much in the way of fear, but a lot of uh, you know stupidity and neurotic behaviors. So, and I'm not sure. You know, one of the things I would like to do, as in time, uh, when when time and and resources permit, is to work with you know, like I'd like to be able to get together with a group of people who are really interested in uh, uh, in learning how to most effectively uh, bring this work to the world. I'd like to be able to talk with people, or, you know, people who are actually interested in doing that. I'd like to be able to talk with people directly so that we all can, so that those of us who are interested in this have an opportunity to work together and be effective in bringing this, which is the only hope we have. You know, we, it's a, it's a well-known, uh, it's a well-known fact that human uh, society goes through crises that, they are, that are pretty much predictable. And it seems like they're in the hundred year range. The human family, the human, human, the, the human, humanity will go crazy. And that's what we're in now. That's what we were in a hundred years ago. And that's what we're in now. And the thing about it is that each time, because of the fact that we have become better at killing each other and more effective at killing each other and hurting each other and enslaving each other and, and, and impoverishing each other and so forth, each iteration of this cycle is worse than the one before. And God knows if anybody out there is has been paying any attention at all to the state of the world, you can see that we are certainly in approaching the, the high point of that crisis that comes upon us in a cyclical fashion. And sooner or later, you know, <laughs> if, 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 if these crises keep getting worse every time, sooner or later, we'll, we'll be done for. Might be this time. It really, this is, this is not a, a very good time of, time of life for our human beings. We're in a, a world of trouble. And the only thing, I'm absolutely convinced of this in my heart, in my heart, the only thing that can possibly save us is to bring this to the world, is to take a chance on driving humanity sane. Take a chance on finding a way to be a part of this, to be a part of the development of this, the understanding of this, and uh, be a part of the development of the outreach of this to people. Right now, the only people, you know, I'm not, and I'm not saying there are many people. We, we, we have tens of thousands of people come to the website every month. Tens of thousands. We have a considerable uh, understanding, a considerable sense, a considerable certainty that many of those people are actually doing what we're suggesting to them and will definitely go safe in the near future. Um, but the time grows late for us. I really believe that. I'm not a, a, a doomsayer normally, but we're in deep trouble here. And we have, Carl and I have, and you have, all of you, everybody that's listening here, all of you have what's needed to put an end to this once and for all. To put an end to the, the misery, to put an end to the idea that I can find a solution 
outside of myself. The end of the idea that <clears throat> that my what what makes my life miserable is because you're here. An end to those ideas. An end to the idea that life is miserable. Life as a human being is not soft and easy. You know, that's what we have conditioned ourselves to believe is the preferred state. Soft and easy. No problems, no difficulties, no puzzles to solve. But when sanity strikes, it strikes in a human mind, in a human world, where <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you that whatever, however I might characterize the nature of being in a human world, being uh, at peace and unconcerned about anything is the farthest from what I would have to say. We're in deep trouble. And I, again, just to wrap this up, I am convinced, Carl and I are convinced, that what we have stumbled upon here will do the trick. That we actually can bring something to the world that may slow down the rush to oblivion. That may bring, increase the level of sanity in the human community. And, yeah. Okay, here's a, a question from Anton, which is, is becoming more aware of insane patterns in myself and others a sign of progress? What are the signs of progress? <laughs> Great question. Uh, Oh yes, becoming more aware of insane patterns in you and others is definitely a sign of progress. You see, the fear, the, the uh, algorithms of the fear are uh, disguise themselves. They don't want you to see even that they are there, much less that there's something you can do about them. I mean, I'm acting as if they have agency, which they don't, of course. They're just algorithms. But that's the way they behave. They, um, they don't arrive as something outside of yourself. They arrive as your actual experience of your life. So that when you become aware of these insane patterns... Becoming aware of the insane patterns is uh, is uh, <laughs> is proof of the pudding. The, the the system that's there that creates all the problems it has no interest in making you aware of the fact that you're crazy. Quite the opposite, so that. When you become more aware of insane patterns in yourself, you can be certain that that's a, a confirming sign that help is on the way, that it's going, that things are going to turn out right. Probably it, it would depend on how, what you mean by seeing the, the uh, insane patterns in others. Uh, you know, I, I can't really speak to that. I, I know that I am myself aware of the insanity around me and most of the time don't like to be around people for that very reason. But I also, uh, you know, unless, unless it's in the context in which we can do something be helpful to people. But uh, it, it's obvious to me, you know, you pick up, it, doesn't <laughs> it doesn't take me free from fear to see that there is a, an ocean of insanity 
I think that recognizing the particular instances of insanity around you might well be due to your increased sensitivity to the presence of those things. When you're, when you're sick, when you're deep into the, the sickness itself, you yourself don't see them as something outside of yourself. Or at least that way I didn't. I saw them to be, well, me. My experience. It was me. It was my life. Just the way it was. It wasn't something that was optional or something that I could see to be, uh, you know, something other than me. So, and I didn't see it in others either. I saw others either to be those folks who I could take advantage of, those folks who who might hurt me, who were, you know, steal from me or kill me or, or do something else like that. And those of and those of those of the people there who were, you know, uh, suckers. Uh, I did not have a sense. My own misery <laughs> was way too big to for me to know anything about. I always thought that I was the only one. See, we all think that. I think I was the only one that was so sick, so screwed up. Uh, <laughs> uh, so anyway, so yes, if you recognize these patterns arriving within you, you could take that as an ex an extreme confirmation that the work is being done. What you really have to do, really, if you don't do this, you're just going to end up, you know, free from the fear and your life will be okay, but you'll just be on your own, like there's nobody else in the world. We know people like that. That's the way I would be if I was, if people would leave me alone. So, anyway, help us. Help me, help me. <laughs> okay? And you, start, if you haven't already started, start self-directed attention. This is much more than merely something to make you feel better. This is the heart and soul of your ability to have control over your life and over your mind. That's what's at stake here. That's what's at stake in your decision to work with self-directed attention or to just say, oh, I'll come out here. So, so there.